Hello, and welcome to the new Civil Liberties Alliance's Lunch and Law Series. I'm Kara Rollins, Litigation Counsel with NCLA. Today we are talking about the new Biden administration and the utility of humility with Professor Susan E. Dudley. Susan is the director of the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center, which she established in 2009. She's also a distinguished professor of practice in the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. Prior to that, Professor Dudley served as the presidentially appointed administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the U.S. Office of Management and Budget from April 2007 through January 2009. Susan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kara. And for those unfamiliar with the Regulatory Studies Center, would you provide an overview of the center's research and your work there? Yeah, so our the center's mission is to improve regulatory policy through research, education, and outreach. We're an academic unit of the university, and as you mentioned, the public policy school there. We've got a small team of research faculty as well as faculty from throughout different departments within the university, um, policy analysts, et cetera. And are there certain areas of research that the center focuses on? Um, a variety of things. So we like to cover all topics related to regulation. Uh, we um, are very interested in regulatory practice, but we will also roll up our sleeves and get involved in specific individual regulations, filing comments on the record um, to suggest ways to make it, um, to improve them. I know I'm a regular reader of the Center's Regulation Digest. Are there other research publications that the Center produces that may be of interest to the audience? I'm glad you like the digest. Um, yeah, that goes it makes out. Makes my every... life easier. <laughs> yeah, um, Bryce Chenault reads the, and his colleagues read the Federal Register, so you don't have to do that. So he does pull together different regulations that are underway, executive orders. So this has been a very busy week for the digest, um, as well as what think tanks around town are saying about regulatory matters and um, media. So it's it's just a nice compendium if you're interested in. US regulation. We have um, another mailing list that you could sign up for that provides updates on our own research, whereas the digest covers ours, but also a lot of other groups around town, including NCLAs. Um, and it's not only our research, but events that we have. Wonderful. So there's many of us on the call today who do either practice administrative law or practice in the regulatory sphere, but NCLA's audience tends to also extend outside of the beltway. For those who are joining us today who maybe aren't as familiar with OIRA or OMB, could you give a little bit of overview of how those offices are structured, where they fall in the federal government, and what you know your role as administrator of OIRA entailed? Yeah, so OIRA has been called the most important office you never heard of. I think most people have probably heard of OMB. It's a cabinet level department in the executive office of the president. So it's the it's a small office, about 500 people. So by a cabinet agency size, it's small, but it's the biggest office within, o within the executive office of the president. And it's also interesting and unusual because it is mostly career civil servants who don't change when presidencies change. Whereas, you know, every everybody in the West Wing does change with administrations. So I think of OMB's role is to be kind of the check on agencies within the, within the executive branch. It provides that check. Um, it reviews agencies' budgets and it prepares the president's budget every year. So agencies naturally would like a larger budget, more resources, more legislative authority, more regulations. And OMB's job in each of those areas is to look across the administration and, and push back. Um, so OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs that I headed, um, they wear several hats. One is, the, an analytical review of all significant regulations. So before a regulation is published, both at the proposed stage, but also in the final stage, it goes to OMB for review. So part of that review is what President Obama called a dispassionate and analytical second opinion. So it's looking at principles and policies and analysis that every president, every recent president has required. Um, it also has a coordinating function. And this is something true for OMB across all the different parts of OMB is that they, they have that perspective and coordinate across different, different agencies to make sure that 
one side of the government knows what the other is doing. So avoiding conflicting or duplicative regulations. Um, and the other part of OIRA's job, and again, OMB's, is that even though it is mostly career civil servants, they, um, they work closely with the policy, the political policy officials in the White House. And so they help ensure that the president's priorities are reflected in agency rulemaking. They also cover information collection, data quality, information policy broadly, international regulatory cooperation, statistical policy. Um, so there's, they have a wide range of issues beyond regulation. So it sounds like they're doing a little bit of everything. One of the things that you mentioned that OIRA and OMB handle are looking at significant regulations. And I think one of the criticisms that you hear depending on where you sit is some regulations take too long, some regulations are passed too quickly. I mean, how does the OMB OIRA process fit into sort of the speed of, and speed and regulatory expediency issues that we hear sometimes in the administrative state? Yeah, there, um, OIRA has been criticized since it was created in 1980, um, 1981, um, for slowing things down. But I think when people have looked empirically, so there are always anecdotes that you can find, when people have looked empirically, that doesn't seem to hold up. Um, I think also OIRA review tends to make the regulations better. So even if it adds an extra week during the development process, it may save lots of times in lit lots of time and resources in litigation after the fact, if it makes it a better regulation. Was there anything during your time as administrative OIRA that surprised you about either the role that you were playing or how the office functions in general? So I had worked at OIRA in its very early days. I was on the career staff in the 1980s when it was quite young. Um, I thought I turned my phone on do not disturb. Um, is, and so one big change when I came back 20 years later um, was how the, the tech changes. So regulation and the regulatory practice has changed a huge amount. Um, so that's one thing. So there wasn't a lot that I surprised, surprised me about the OIRA process because I knew it so well. But I think what might surprise other people is that it's a lot, OIRA's role is a lot more than just benefit cost analysis. And that's a criticism, and I think that's a criticism that um, progressives in particular have had, that it's just this green eye shade cost minimizer. Um, and so there is a big emphasis to have this administration have a wire behave differently. But I think that's a misconception. Could you give an example of what you mean by sort of the difference between the misconception and how the office functions, you know, in reality, at least in your view and your experience? Yeah, so um, benefit cost analysis is one element of the, in, the analysis that presidents going back to Reagan and actually Reagan built on Carter's and um, before, even before that. Um, so cost benefit analysis is one element, but the first step is let's identify, explain the compelling need for the regulation. Let's look at alternatives. And often alternatives is a very important way to think about is a regulatory approach the best way to achieve a policy goal. Um, and then to look at the different alternatives and look at their benefits, their costs, and who pay, who bears those costs and who receives the benefits. So the distributional impact is, is very important. And then, as I said, the, the value of that interagency coordination to make sure that the government isn't doing things that are um, stepping on each other's toes. For those that are interested in, in this process or cost benefit analysis, or maybe changes that are gonna occur as you suggested um, because of the critiques of cost benefit or the critiques of OIRA, uh, you know, where, where would somebody who's interested in this that again is not as familiar with the process go to see what work OIRA is doing? I mean, is it something that it is published in Federal Register or is it online? I mean, how, how does the information and work that OIRA does get shared with the broader, you know, country? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it largely doesn't. So OIRA's role is a very internal facing role. So it consults with agencies, it coordinates within the federal government, but it is the agency's de final decision. The agency has the authority to issue the regulation. So um, the agency will be transparent about all the factors that went into their regulatory decision. 
one thing, if you really do care about what happened during the OIRA-led interagency review, they will they provide a red line version of the regulation as it came into review and the version um, when it's completed. And so you can look at that red line. You don't necessarily know why the changes were made or who made them. But it does give some insight that, you know, A went in and C came out. Yeah, yeah. And also another thing, OIRA is probably the most, one of the more transparent organizations with, within government. If they do meet with people outside the government, outside the federal government, they only do so when the regulation is under review and they are transparent. They post on their website the fact that they had that meeting and who attended both people from the government and also people from outside the government. Also, if um, I'll make a plug for an article that I recently published that I think is the definitive history and explanation of OIRA. It's in the journal Regulation and Governance. Um, and if people are interested, you can see um, a link to it on the Regulatory Study Center website. Great. I mean, I think, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, I think that, and, and you summed it up quickly, it's the it's the one office nobody heard of, but has its hand in, in, in a little bit of everything here. Um, you know, given your experience as the administrator of IRA, what sort of takeaways or broad lessons did you um, bring with you that you now apply to your work and research at the Regulatory Studies Center? So I am a firm believer in the importance of trying to understand regulatory impacts to the best that we can before they're issued. So the importance of that regulatory impact analysis, and there has been bipartisan support for that. Um, that's important. Also, I think of engaging broad public comment. I think we could do that better than we do now. So earlier in the commenting, earlier in the rig development process to get input from, from the public, I think could be valuable. And the one thing that I think we don't do well enough. So I think in many ways, the US regulatory process is the gold standard for the world. Mm -hmm. The fact that we do that impact, that analysis in advance and that we um, seek public, broad public comment, not just getting stakeholder views. Um, those tend to be the gold standard. But where I think we could do better is once a regulation is in place, it's kind of there and we don't look back to see whether it's working, whether we could learn from why it isn't working to make better regulations going forward. I want to follow up on some points you made because I think that th there's some interesting um, issues that it raises. You know, when we talk about regulatory impacts, obviously you talk about cost benefit analysis. What other sort of impacts does the government take in when it's it's issuing regulations and who's setting what needs to be considered? So um, the, there's an executive order from um, 1993 that President Clinton signed, and it builds on an executive order that Ronald Reagan had signed in 1981, and which built on something that Jimmy Carter had signed. <laughs> so it's, there's, there's a long history of this. And um, it's, it's the things that I mentioned that before you even begin, before you start to quantify benefits and costs, ask, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Is there some reason that we think markets aren't working efficiently or is there some government, other government action that's interfering with, with market processes? Um, or is it because we're concerned about distributional impact? So it may, doesn't necessarily have to be you know, a, um, a market failure. So that first question is very important and has been important going back to President Carter. Um, and that it's important to look at the rule of law and property rights and understand have we are we disrupting those because if you continue if you're constantly churning regulations, even if you think you have a good idea and can make things better. Um, that uncertainty alone can be a problem so um, thinking through not only your objectives with the regulation, but what might go wrong, what are the unintended consequences. And we'll never get it right. The ex ante analysis will never be perfect, but and if you I, don't do it, then you're just guessing. As you said, you know, it just sounds like you know we've developed a system. It's not perfect, but it goes a lot further than other systems that have been developed. So, you know, we can begrudge it um, and have our you know tweaks that we'd like to make. But I think that you know mm -hmm. just sort of having the memory that at least we have the ability and the platform to comment directly on regulations that impact our lives is 
hugely important. And I want to sort of pivot that into you mentioned the idea of, you know, one way to fix this is to include earlier input. Um, on the regulatory process, you know, how would you envision doing that? Have past administrations tried? Um, you know, what what sort of a way to to get folks talking and shaping the policy earlier? Yeah, um, every one of those administrations I've mentioned has tried, and I think the challenge is so we've done better at the ex ante review because if agencies don't conduct that analysis. They aren't going to get their regulation through OIRA and they won't get it in place. Whereas once a regulation is in place, the agency's incentives are much less to evaluate whether it's working. Because in part, you know, the glory and credit goes to coming up with something new, not fixing sludge that may be accumulating in the system. Um, so every president has asked agencies to do it, but there hasn't really been that incentive to do it. Um, also, on the incentive side, regulated parties have, before they're regulated, they would like to prevent regulation that would interfere with their, their processes. But once they've complied with the regulation, they're also much less enthusiastic about having it changed because now they've complied, they may have a competitive advantage um, over, uh, you know, another um, a competitor. So I think there are incentive problems there. Also, it's just difficult to do. You know, some people say, well, we have the least amount of information before the regulation is issued. Afterwards, we have information, but we don't have the counterfactual or what you in the antitrust world might say the but for world. So it still is hard to measure. And so, you know, one of the things that I think is important at this moment in time is that when you were OIR administrator, you oversaw sort of the transition between uh, President Bush's um, last days in office into mm -hmm. President Obama's. Um, what insights can you share about how the office works in transition? And what can you glean about sort of the transition period that happened from the Trump administration to the Biden administration? Yeah, transitions are very interesting, especially at OMB. So after an election is certified, after GSA certifies it, the career staff are working both with the outgoing administration to implement their priorities, but also the incoming transition team. So they're you know, juggling between or, or working, trying to do both. Um, and so uh, on the regulatory side, so on the budget side, they're kind of developing budgets, you know, implementing the existing, the outgoing president's budget while developing a budget priorities for the new president. On the regulatory side, it's even more challenging because this is the president's the outgoing president's last chance to put his policies in place and regulation is a nice way to do that or is a, an efficient way to do that. Um, so there is motivation to finalize regulations and get priorities in place. Um, so, um, so the OMB staff is working aggressively with the outgoing president to get their regulations published in the federal register um, while simultaneously helping the incoming team, or at least knowing that on January 20th at noon, they will be pulling all those regulations back to the extent they can. Well, I think that, that leads me to an interesting point. You know, you've written on this topic a lot. You know, this sort of tran transition period has what we call midnight regulations, this glut of, you know, the cynic in me says, who can I give to my favorite people before I leave office? Um, you know, how do we define midnight regulations? And how do administrations use them? And I mean, what do we see in terms of volume of midnight regulations? Yeah, so there's really no, uh, the definition that I use and that I think is the best definition of midnight regulations is those rules that are finalized between election day and inauguration day. So that last, that um, last quarter of a president's term. Um, the historically, Statistically, there is a dramatic uptick in regulatory activity. Um, Daniel Perez um, at the Regulatory Study Center and others have studied that, and he's found that there are three to four times as many regulations in that quarter, that final quarter, as they are during that same period in previous years of a president's term. Um, so just quickly, so the reason people are concerned about midnight regulations is your cynical observation that you don't want something that's rushed into place as a lame duck 
that hasn't gone through the things that I think are important, the analysis and the opportunity for public engagement to make sure that it's robust. So um, on the other hand, regulations do take time to put in place. And so sometimes midnight regulations, it's really just the culmination of work that's been going on for years because regulations can take two to four years to get in place. So, so, I mean, there's sort of a mixture, it sounds like, that there's regulations that are really, again, the cynic in me saying the giveaways, and then there's also the regulations that were already in the pipeline that, for one reason or another, just happened to be promulgated during that time period. Yeah, and even the giveaways are hard because they have to have gone through the process, the Administrative Procedure Act process of, um, in most cases, of issuing notices, getting comments, and they may have done it in a rushed way, and they may have short um, circuited some of the analysis. Um, so yes, um, we, we, we look at regulations. So there are about four, three to 4,000 regulations issued every year. Um, three to 400 of those we consider significant and 30 to 40 of those we consider economically significant. Um, in midnight years, we see more of those or you know, a bigger number of economically significant and significant regulations. So for example, President Trump, whose regulatory level was so dramatically less than any previous president, even going back to Reagan. So in his first three years, a lot less regulation. In his final year, he issued 129 economically significant regulations. In January alone, 28. So any economically significant, I should define, those are regulations with him expected to have impacts, cost or benefits of 100 million or more per year. What is the survivability of a midnight regulation? Or, you know, say it another way, you, know, you issue these substantive regulations at the end of an, an outgoing administration, you know, are they merely the expression of outgoing policy? Do they ever actually go into place? I mean, how, how do these actually work? Yeah, so um, regulations, once they're published in the Federal Register, the only way they can be undone is to do the same steps. So that means you have to develop a record, you have to go through, issue a proposal, get comment, and then issue a final rule. So um, that's a year's worth of effort that the new administration would have to go through. So there are, depending on when it was issued, a few other things could happen. So if, if it's published in the Federal Register, but not yet effective, the agency could post another notice in the register delaying that effective date while they take time to evaluate it. If it is sent to the Federal Register or signed or finished, but, but not published yet, then it's not final and the new team can do, they don't have to go through procedures. Um, there's also, I don't know if you wanna talk about the Congressional Review Act, but for regulations issued this year since August 21st of 2020, are subject to disapproval by Congress. Can you, um, for our audience who may not be as familiar with the CRA, because again, it's one of those things I think, you know, it's not, it doesn't even come up every four years, it tends to come up every transition where you're going from one party in office to another. You know, what's the CRA? I believe it was passed in 1996. Um, so it's a relatively young statute um, by our measure. Um, you know, what is it? How has it operated in the past? And, and what are the prospects for its use in the coming months? Okay. Um, yeah, the CRA is, is a topic on a lot of people's minds right now. Um, it provided or provides Congress expedited procedures to issue a, a resolution disapproving a regulation. So if both houses of Congress um, pass that, pass that uh, then a joint resolution goes to the president's desk. And if the president signs it, that nullifies the regulation. So even if it's been published and even if it's already in effect, it is nullified and the agency can't issue anything that's substantially the same. So it really is, a, it's, it's powerful. It's kind of a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. um, so as you say, it was passed in 1996. It has been used 17 times, once in 2001, and that happened to be during the transition from Clinton to George W. Bush. And then 14 times in the transition between Obama to Trump. And then two times after that, um, 
uh, to disapprove regulations that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued. So President Trump was right. There was a joint resolution landed on his desk and he um, was willing to sign that. Uh, we, we talk a lot about uh, the filibuster here inside the Beltway. Does the filibuster apply to the CRA or is it a straight, you know, majority vote? It does not. It's a simple majority vote and it cannot be filibustered. Okay. And then you also mentioned the, the concept of substantially similar. Um, that sounds like a type of limitation that might give administrations pause to use it. Uh, how, how does that actually play out um, in your experience? Are the, is there reason to think that the Biden administration might be hesitant to use the CRA? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, that language, that caveat was why the Obama administration did not use it to revoke um, Bush, w, George W. Bush regulations. I think many of the regulations that were issued towards the end of the Bush administration were ones that the, the Obama administration would like to tweak, to change, to make more stringent, um, or to modify language. But the substantially similar language, I think, is what um, made them decide it wasn't worth doing. There are also, there were other challenges, even though it's their simple expedited procedures. It still does take floor time. Um, so there, there may be other reasons, but I think that was one. And I have to imagine on the floor time issue, I mean, you're still trying to essentially, you know, at least on the Senate side, form a cabinet. We have an added issue of an impeachment trial that has not been in play in the past. So I think that the timing restriction is an interesting element as well. Yeah, yeah. Congress has other things to be doing right now. When's the, the last, and I, forgive me if you mentioned this earlier, when's the last time, uh, or date rather, that a CRA resolution could be completed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not positive. It's, there, there are several 60 day clocks. And so it's a 60 day clock starting right about now, but it's a 60 session day. So that could be about six months. So I would guess um, May, June might be the, the window. And there's also a 60 day look back and which is often allows the, the new Congress to address regulations issued since maybe May, June of the previous year. This year, because of all the additional set, um, session days with COVID and other things, um, it, it actually only goes back to August 21st. But we've done some calculations and um, looks like there are about 1500 regulations that Congress could overturn using the act. I mean, I, I think if anything that gives you a concept of what the size of the government is and the size of the administrative state as it stands. I mean, 1500 is a, a very large number. Yeah, since right. August, right? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things when we're thinking about regulation, and, and you and I have talked about this before, is with this unique point in time regarding the modern administrative state where um, we had a one term president, and since the passage of the, the Administrative Procedure Act in 1946. Um, that's only happened three times, Carter, H.W. Bush, and now President Trump. I think folks on the outside are watching this as sort of like a ping pong game on regulatory issues, um, especially in light of Biden's first week in office where we saw this flurry of executive orders. Um, you know, is this, is this unique or does it only feel unique because we just don't see it that often? Yeah, I think that there always is. I mean, especially because lately we've had, we've alternated between Republicans and Democrats. And so I think as long as that's the case, we are going to see some of that ping pong. And of course that's what, you know, elections do. So it's it's the will of the people. I think a couple things that are, I mean, as you say, executive orders can be, um, the, 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 new, the incoming president can just wipe out his predecessors and put in his own with the stroke of a pen. Regulations are a little harder to do that. So there, there's a process and that takes time which stabilizes that a little bit. Um, nevertheless, there still is a lot of uncertainty and uncertainty alone is challenging to affected parties. But I do think the one thing that has traditionally been quite stable and I've already I keep on saying the same thing I think on this um, is is the regulatory procedures, but also the regulatory principles that we only want to be issuing regulations that do more good than harm. And we need to measure that to understand what they will. Now, I'm 
a little bit concerned that the, the new administration, while um, reinforcing those principles in one of President Biden's early executive orders, he reinforced a Clinton and um, an Obama executive order on regulatory analysis. Um, but at the same time, he, he says, you know, to the extent it doesn't get in the way of our priorities. So regulatory analysis is fine if it doesn't get in the way of what we want to do, um, which I think is a little bit discouraging. Um, and to a certain extent, all presidents do that. There are some things that, you know, they've got their priorities and well, and I, I think you, you talk about this um, a little bit in your piece that is the, the namesake of, of this particular discussion, and it's a regulatory insight you published titled Advice for the Biden-Harris Administration, Embrace Regulatory Humility. I know in that piece you did talk about the both the Clinton and Obama executive orders. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by regulatory humility? So um, several things. I think largely it's realizing that the, the federal government doesn't have, um, it will, will never have the knowledge um, or the data um, or the ability to achieve all policy goals. And so there should be a pause to respect how market forces work and an acknowledgement that no matter how important you think something is, there are bound to be unintended consequences and they're bound to be rent seeking where people, um, where different parties are able to make it work to their advantage. So the humility calls for thinking it through to the extent you can in advance, being open to diverse public input, evaluating, you know, constantly learning, learning, evaluating, measuring, and then trying to read, you know, that, that cycle of, of analysis based on what you've learned. And, you know, I, obviously you're using it in, in relation to the Biden administration, but I mean, have you seen um, previous administrations try to exercise regulatory humility or in the alternative fail at exercising regulatory humility? Yeah, so I think um, they've all embraced the notion. Those executive orders, I think definitely embrace that notion. Um, but as I mentioned, I think when their priorities conflict with analysis, priorities tend to, to trump. So I think um, in the administration I was in, the Bush administration, the um, Homeland Security was a huge priority. And so often Homeland Security issues would maybe trample what we might think would be important for civil liberties, individual rights, um, maybe lack of regard for unintended consequences. I think um, in, um, in the, oh, Biden administration, I mean, the, the Trump administration, we saw similar things when it came to um, immigration. So even those that really do um, seem to support the analysis, I think if you, if you already know what's right, you don't need to check with other people, you don't need to um, analyze something and gather evidence to support it. I think so in your article, you talk about sort of five areas that are ripe for embracing regulatory humility, and you, you touched on them, obviously, you say understanding the regulatory impacts, and you also talk about equipping OIRA to assure accountability. What do, you do, what do you mean by that in terms of where OIRA is now and where they have the potential to grow in the future? Well, OIRA, when it was formed in 1981, had a um, hundred, a staff of a hundred. Um, it now has a staff of about 60. So, gosh, I don't know if I have a note on this. Um, I think I don't, but it's a very dramatic. It's it's like fifteen hundred to two thousand to one in terms of agency regulators and the OIRA staff that is doing that review. So, I, I would encourage the new administration to increase the OIRA staff so that they can be more effective in that um, that role of providing the checks and balances on agencies. Another topic you, you talk about, and we've touched on it a couple of times, I think it goes into your point earlier about you know, getting diverse inputs and getting diverse inputs sooner. You talk about you know, being transparent and open to the wisdom of diverse sources. I think um, you know, we at NCLA had done a lot of work with executive orders uh, 13891 and 13892. They were revoked on day one. Um, you know, where do you see, you know, did that signal anything for you 
in terms of where this agency views transparency in regulatory processes? Yeah, so um, several of, so President Biden did revoke several of Trump's executive orders and a lot of them were expected. Um, the, um, those related to transparency and guidance documents which has been a bipartisan or nonpartisan concern for decades. Um, so numerous reports from the American Bar Association Administrative Conference of the United States. And the concerns are several fold. One is that sometimes guidance documents, enforcement officials might use them as if they're binding. When by definition, if it's binding, it needs to go through the APA notice and comment process. So guidance, uh, guidance documents that um, that don't go through that process but are used as guide, uh, binding are a problem. Um, even worse, I think, is that often people don't know where to find those guidance documents. So they're, they're, if they're posted at all on wage agencies' websites, they may be buried in different places. So the first of the two executive orders you mentioned required agencies first to be clear in the document that it was non-binding and second to post them to evaluate all their documents, see which ones they were no longer using and to post the ones that they did want to keep in a central portal. To me, that's just important transparency. Agencies had already done it. And yet President Biden's executive order said, I'm revoking the executive order, and I'm telling agencies to pull back any rules or any actions that implemented it. So I don't know what that means. Are agencies now taking down? It looks like some agencies are archiving those central portals. So here you've done something that's so valuable and so transparent. And so I, I really wonder what the new administration's plan is to ensure that people know what those guidance documents are and and what their effect is, what force they have. I think I think those are all um, important points. I think one of the things is, do we have any? You know, we talk about guidance, and um, you know, we also call it sort of sub-regulatory, right? And for the folks out there that aren't familiar with guidance, as you mentioned, you know, they don't have the force and effect of law. They're meant to sort of put the agency's position on a particular regulation or law a little bit clearer. I mean, but we've seen guidances over the past. I always think of the Dear Colleague letter from the Department of Education, which sort of launched a thousand lawsuits and an entire compliance industry. Um, you know, if, if people don't know what the law says or they can't find the guidance, I mean, what do you, do you see any changes in the way that regulations are enforced as a result of this revocation? Or is it just going to continue to muddy the waters? Yeah, I mean, and it certainly could. And, you know, guidance documents can be very valuable because, you know, regulation can't conceive of every alternative and especially small businesses often welcome guidance. You know, here's what our regulatory code says, but here's what we mean. And here's a safe harbor. If you did that, do this, we, we will consider you in compliance. I'm not saying it's not valuable. It can be very valuable. Where it's a problem and that people have raised this problem over the years, is where it is used in enforcement. And I know in the financial markets, banks, bank examiners will use numerical limits that are set in guidance documents. They, that never received public comment. It never got the input from, from different banks, small banks, large banks, um, um, bank clients to understand whether those um, criteria make sense. And yet examiners will use them to bring enforcement actions or to count as violations against the, the, the regulation when it's not in the regulatory code at all. Those are problems. And um, so I think the new administration is going to have to, they revoked that, I, I, I regret that they did. And I think they're going to have to come back with something because it's, it's been a longstanding problem and it would be a shame to go backtrack on the positive effects. Especially as you mentioned something that you know has had bipartisan and sort of universal support, mm -hmm. even amongst the regulated community for a long time. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I just want to remind folks in the audience that if you do have a question that you want to ask Susan, you can put it in the chat, uh, the Q and A chat box. It should be located at the bottom of your platform, and we'll be moving to Q and A soon. Um, one of the other things, thinking about your piece and regulatory humility, and again, I, you know, we touched on some of these topics. I think they're they're woven into your experience and 
and the work that you've done since uh, you left OIRA, but we talk about embracing learning, evaluation and measurement, and, and regulating smarter. I think one of the things that myself and my colleagues and other sort of uh, administrative attorneys see is that there seems to be sometimes a disparity between the regulators and the enforcement aspect of agencies. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if that's, they just don't talk to each other or whatever it may be, but, you know, is there any sort of way to adjust the on the ground impacts by looking at the outcomes of enforcement actions? Yeah, so I have spent much less of my career focusing on that. So I'm more on the, the administrative law, the development of regulation and evaluation. But I think it's an excellent idea because whatever regulation may look like on paper, understanding how it actually works in practice, how it's being enforced and how it's being perceived and how it changes um, affected parties' behavior, I think that's essential. Because if we don't understand that, then we're not designing regulations to be smart and efficient. That sounds good. Um, so, you know, you just, and we, again, we've, we've intermixed it in the conversation. You published a piece, leave either yesterday or today, that's kind of a, an evaluation of Biden administration's first week in office. We touched on some of the issues, the revocation of orders. Um, is there anything in, in your newest article that you think is really important to highlight for, you know, folks as they're out here watching what's going on. Um, I, you know, I've watched the past week and have felt from a regulatory aspect or um, an observer of administrative law that's a bit like drinking from the fire hose right now. And, you know, are there, there are things that should be highlighted that have occurred in the past week or so that you think are important for people to follow moving forward? Yeah, so um, just some quick things that happened on the first day. One was um, the chief of staff sent a memo that said, kind of stop the presses on new regulations. We don't want to do anything until um, the new team has a chance to evaluate it. That's something that goes way back. Each incoming team chief of staff does just kind of stop the presses so that we have a, an end to the outgoing team's work and a beginning of the new. Although interestingly, the Federal Register on January 21st and 22nd is still publishing things from the previous administration. So we had um, President Trump had a couple of executive orders, new executive orders that appeared in the Federal Register about the same time that President Biden's executive orders were. Um, another one of President Biden's early actions was the executive order we've talked about that had um, revoked existing executive orders. Um, we've already talked about the guidance one that disappointed me. Another one that disappointed me, although it didn't surprise me as much as the guidance one. I was actually surprised by the guidance order because I, I do think the transparency in guidance documents and the simple things of putting, ha having a portal on the website so that you can see what agency's guidance documents are. We can see what their regulations are. So that one surprised me. Another one that didn't surprise me, but I was still hoping, was an executive order that Trump had put in place um, in his first month in office in um, 2017 that required agencies to have a regulatory review officer and team who was responsible for evaluating existing regulations to see, you know, where can we clean out the sludge? You know, what can we, um, how are regulations actually working? Are there things that aren't working that we can, um, remove or just modify so that they work better. That was another one that President Biden um, revoked on the first day. And as I say, I, it's not too surprising, but I was a little disappointed. Um, the other big thing that he um, issued was a memorandum and executive orders and memorandums can really be interchangeable. The executive order is a little more official because it's numbered and published in the Federal Register, but memoranda are often, often also, and they have the same effect. So the effect is only to tell the executive branch how to do things. It should not have an effect on parties outside. So the memorandum that the president signed on modernizing regulatory review and practice, that had some good elements. I was pleased that it may, retained, explicitly retained the Clinton and the Obama orders that my earlier piece encouraged them to retain. Um, I also think an important thing that it talked about was distributional impacts. Those understanding not just the, the 
net benefits, the benefits minus the costs in total, but who bears them is really important. And, and these executive orders all talk about the importance of that, but there's, it, it's, there aren't um, clear guidelines on how to do that. So I think that is an important thing that this administration plans to do. I'm also a little bit concerned and this, I meant, talked about this concern in my earlier piece on regulatory humility, that the problem with distributional impact analysis is that you have to be careful. Regulations confer advantages on one party over another. And so you have to be very aware of it. That should be part of the distributional impact analysis because otherwise well-connected parties can um, can get to, to, can achieve their goals at the expense of those that are not well connected and I think we are seeing some of that um, the Biden memo itself was it, it had lists of people or organizations or types of groups to talk to to get yeah. feedback and um, it it was um, environmental groups those focused on um, social justice and labor unions. So those are the groups that clearly are going to have a voice and it may leave the average citizen, the small business um, with less of a voice in the regulatory process. But overall, and as I said, I've seen this with every administration, we, we like this analysis as long as it doesn't get in the way of what we wanna do. Um, the Biden administration has a very ambitious regulatory agenda, and um, I did not see a lot of regulatory humility in that uh, memorandum. In fact, I think there's even, I would even call it hubris. Mm -hmm. We know what's right, and we're just going to plow ahead with it, and we're going to do it fast, and so we don't need all this process and all this input and, um, and the analysis. And that remains to be seen, but... Um, there was a tone in the order that I found disappointing. But I think to, to your point on, on hubris, and I think it's not unique um, to party identification whatsoever, is that you know when you do this sort of, we know better and we will regulate as we see fit. I mean, I think one of the things that you end up seeing and you've talked about it before is there's gonna be litigation. <laughs> and I think that you know one of the things to, to watch for folks who are or interested in what's going on is, you know, I, I believe the first lawsuit against a Biden administrative action was filed last Friday mm -hmm. um, regarding uh, immigration issues and deportation issues. I mean, that's that's going to be the first of many mm -hmm. over the next few months, and that's another way that regulation obviously gets shaped. Um, one of the things you were talking about is the regulatory freeze and, and delays in the Federal Register. Um, it, regulatory freeze doesn't mean that there won't be regulations coming out, correct? Right, sorry, I should, yes. So the regulatory freeze just says freeze things that the previous administration had in the pipeline until we have new officials, Biden administration appointees in place to evaluate them. So no, it isn't committing to freeze going forward. And do you, you know, I think this kind of goes back to your experience at the Bush transition and, and obviously your research what have you seen in terms of how agencies actually ramp up their their regulatory processes at the beginning of an administration? I mean, you know, should are we going to start seeing regulations coming out in the next couple of weeks, or is there a real delay in in what it takes to get things done? Yeah, that's a good question. There usually is a, a slow period at the beginning of an administration because it takes time to develop a record to support a, a new policy. So, and um, if you don't mind, I'll jump back to your comment about the role of the courts, because I do think that's important and we haven't talked about it much. That, um, so the opportunity for notice and comment is important, but also in the US, um, affected parties can sue over regulation that doesn't either meet procedural requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act or isn't, um, consistent with the Constitution, or if the the analysis doesn't support the regulation. So agencies in developing a regulation have to develop a docket that can withstand court evaluation because they're, um, you know, if it's a significant regulation, 
odds are there, there will be some litigation over that. So that's an important way for, um, for parties. You should certainly comment on the rulemaking in the, in the comment period. So it doesn't excuse you from doing that because in fact, you wanna put your points in the docket. So you want the docket because if it isn't in the docket, it's going to be hard for you to, to litigate later. Um, but litigation is, is, is very important in the regulatory world. I think we, we've, we've talked about two of the three branches or our third branch out there is obviously Congress. And we talked about it in context of the CRA, but you know, one of the other complicating factors is what does Congress do um, and how does that impact regulations that may be coming forward? And I think, you know, when a statute is passed, obviously then there's implementing regulations. I mean, what does that process typically look like as folks are hearing, oh, well, this bill was sponsored on the Hill or it passed the House, it's going in the Senate. You know, what's sort of the lag time delay process between a law getting, you know, signed by the president and actually being implemented in a way that's recognizable in a regulatory sense? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's another good question and it varies a lot. So there, there will be some laws, often when a law is newly passed, there'll be some short deadlines, you know, issue regulations within, um, you know, a year, you know, within six months issue a proposal and 12 months a year. Often those deadlines are too short and agencies don't quite make them. Um, but then there are other regulations that we see that are based on statutes that were passed decades ago. So often Congress will pass statutes that are broadly phrased enough and then delegate authority to the agencies to issue regulations within that broad um, phrasing. Um, so that that means that a lot of the regulations that we're, we're seeing, in fact, um, anything really related to climate change, for example, is based on statutes from, um, from the 70s or 90s, 1970s or 1990s. I think we're about to start. I've, I've seen a bunch of questions come into the queue, and I think we're about to start to turn to uh, Q&A from the audience. Again, if you're interested in asking Susan a question, you can type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the platform. And I, I'm going to turn to some audience questions right now. Um, Josh asked, what legal weight is attached to public comments in a notice uh, NPRM? Notice, <sighs> I'm getting this tied up, <laughs> uh, in an NPRM. <laughs> Um, there are often voices and facts on both sides of a regulation. What happens to those as they go through? Yeah, so the role of public comment is, is really interesting, important, and often not understood. So it is not a referendum. So if there are, you know, a thousand comments on one side and 10 on the other, but the 10 are substantive and have useful information that the agency can use to build a, a substantive record, the 10 is gonna matter more than the thousand. So often there will be comment campaigns where um, a lot of comments are generated and they tend to be very short and express um, an opinion um, as opposed to providing some facts or some substantive basis for it. There are reasons for doing that. My colleague in the political science department, Steve Bala, mm -hmm. says that, that those can be very valuable for a lot of reasons but they're not likely to actually influence the regulation. They may influence Congress um, and they may you know, help the, organi the organization that is gathering those comments. They may help with fundraising and raising awareness, but they are not nearly as likely to affect the outcome of the regulation as a substantive comment. And I know I've seen these on sort of comment doc dockets myself. You know, you'll see all of a sudden you'll get a list and then it'll be all the same comment over and over again. I mean, how do the agencies actually go through combing through that type of, you know, mass campaign, as you said? Yeah, it's not that hard. So they have software that can find identical or near identical comments. So, you know, there's concern about those. Um, and of course, there's concern about fake comments or bot comments. I think those are more legitimate concerns. The concerns about mass comment campaigns, I think it's part of our democracy, it's part of our rulemaking process. And if people want to send um, a, a comment that's identical to a thousand other people and express their view on the record, I think that's, um, they're, they're free to do that, but we should recognize that they're less likely to change the rulemaking. And as I say, it's not that hard for agencies to sort mm -hmm. through the wheat from the chaff. 
But, you know, I think to, to that point, one of the things, as you mentioned earlier, the United States is a unique system where we can even comment on regulations in the first instance. So individuals who are interested can go on federal register, see if comments are being accepted. And from what I'm hearing you say is instead of just expressing an opinion, I don't like this, it's bad, is put some more substance to your words. And, and that's more persuasive for the agency when they're reviewing it. Yeah. yeah, because if you say, I don't like this because this is the effect it will have on my small business, or this is the effect it will have on me as a consumer of, of something um, or as, a, as an employee, that's information the agency can use. Because as I said, agencies don't have, um, they don't have complete information. They never will have complete information. So um, trying to get those diverse views and what, what Friedrich Hayek called the, um, the um, circumstances of time and place. There are people who know something about the effect of that regulation the agency couldn't possibly know. And so that kind of information can be very valuable. And this is more of a, a function question again, related to public comments, but Dennis asked, how does OIR determine days for public comments? And he says, whether to allow internal agency circulated analysis days with same time out for requesting public comments. Yeah, so they don't do that as a rule. Um, the OIR review process includes the internal, um, they get comments from other agencies, just quick on, on that. When uh, there's their policy analysts in, in that small staff in OIR who are dedicated to a particular agency or part of an agency, they'll get a rule that's submitted through this portal and that you, it goes right up on the website. So you know that OIR has a regulation under review. At that time, they'll look at it and share it with other agencies that might have an interest um, and say to them, get back to me in 30 days if you've got any concerns or issues on this. Um, and this is how they kind of triage because they always have too many regulations of reviewing at any given moment. Um, and, so, and most often other agencies don't have concerns and there's very little review, whereas, um, but sometimes they're, that generates big concerns. So that happens usually within, um, it's supposed to happen within a 90 day window, but there is an opportunity for extension. And so sometimes that OIR review can last more than a year. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get proposed for the first time until then. And then OIRA does weigh in on how long that comment period should be. The Administrative Procedure Act says 30 days at least. The Congressional Review Act says it's major, at least 60 days. Sometimes agencies will do it for 90 or, or more, but that's usually an agency decision. And unless they want to short circuit or do it shorter than the APA or the CRA, OIRA would probably defer to the agency. What about, and, and Adia has a question to this, sort of the next step. What about those, the ones that sort of extend well beyond the deadlines? You know, he says, sometimes we see Congress impose deadlines on agencies to issue regulations. For example, agencies shall issue regulations within two years after the effective date of this act. How does OIRA deal with regulations that don't adhere to the congressionally set deadlines? And what do you do as a commentator or, or a regulated party to, to, I guess, push that issue in some way? Yeah, so OIRA actually got sued back when I was there on the career staff for holding for review past a, a court order deadline. So there was um, a court agree deadline. Um, so OIRA never does that now. So it, it, if there's a, a court order deadline, especially that's taken very seriously. Statutory deadlines um, are, are taken seriously, but not quite so much because they are often issue regulations in an unreasonable time frame. And so um, OIRA will tend to have a review, but they will limit it. They won't extend the review. Um, for long periods. But one of the interesting things, so as I said, OIRA is pretty transparent. Um, you don't know what they're talking about between the agencies. That's deliberative within the executive branch. Um, but when, a re when they conclude review of a regulation, they'll either, they'll say it's, it was consistent with the executive orders as written. It was consistent after changes were made during the review process. Um, most are in that category or it will say we're concluding because there's a statutory or judicial deadline. deadline, And that means that, so if you see that in the concluded, it means we've got a deadline. We're not saying whether we think it passed muster or not. We're just saying we have to because another branch of government 
has given us a deadline that we aren't going to hold it past our standard review time. Great. And there's another interesting question from Marty um, that touches on some of the topics we discussed already. And he, he asked, why do you think the Trump administration, which had passed so few regs during most of its administration, pushed through so many at the end? And can you give an example of two of the economically significant regs that came through at the very end? Yeah, um, so I think it gets to your insight earlier, Kara, and that is that it was a, um, a one-term presidency. So previous administrations, including mine, so I think especially my administration. So I went to OMB in, um, with two years left in the Bush administration. And I was I had already studied midnight regulations and I was really determined that we weren't gonna have re rushed regulations on my watch. Um, so I met with all the agencies. I said, regulations take a long time to issue. So now's the time. If you have priorities, it is not too late to be starting now because I don't want to see something in November of 2008 that you suddenly say is a priority. And the chief of staff, Josh Bolton, reinforced that with a memo that said, here are our deadlines. So I think at the end of the Bush administration, that was... Um, it. It's widely viewed as one of the most respectful and gracious transitions between presidents, the Bush to Obama. Um, and I think it was in the regulatory world as well, because there were fewer of those really last minute regulations. But as it turns out, all I really did is I kind of pushed the increase in regulatory activity earlier in the final year. So if you look at the year as a whole, even though there were very few in January, if you look at the year as a whole, there still was a big uptick in midnight activity. Now, the Trump administration did not know whether this was going to be midpoint in an eight-year administration mm -hmm. or the end. And so I think for two reasons that meant there was more that got crammed right at the end. One was, it just, as I said, it takes time. And so they just, even things that had been working through the, the, the pipeline just hadn't quite gotten to the finish line. Um, but also I think that there was a last minute flurry for things that suddenly seemed like priorities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a question from Duncan. I think you, you touched on this a bit. And I think it's one of the things that complicates executive action is there's many different things a president can sort of issue with his pen and paper. Um, and, and Duncan asks, you know, what about the use of presidential proclamations rather than EOs or guidance memos? You know, are there any differences really between these? I've always seen them as myself as a bit of a stratification. But if you don't mind explaining for the audience, I think you touched on this a little bit, but we didn't cover proclamations, which is one of the other options that a president does have. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then pardons, you know, so there are other things and I'm much less familiar with all of those. Yeah. In terms of a stratification, executive order is probably the most prestigious. They're numbered so that you can go to Wikipedia and you can see all the executive orders that every president has written and what subsequent presidents have revoked and what they've left in place. Memoranda are, um, can achieve the same effect because they also tell the executive branch of government how to do things, how, how to processes or behaviors. Um, but they're not numbered. It's, you, you can't go to Wikipedia and see a list of all the memoranda that different presidents have issued. Um, then the proclamations and other things, they tend to be less prestigious and more statements of, well, and I, and I may not get this right, because as soon as I say it, people will come up with examples <laughs> that, that don't. But, you know, there'll be a proclamation um, uh, naming holidays and things like that, or, um, you know, a certain week. So those tend to be less substantive than orders or memoranda. There's actually... And if people are interested, I could follow up with you, Kara. I saw a great um, USA Today article that explained it all nicely. I think the author's name is Greg Court, K-O-R-T-E. Mm -hmm. So I think if you look up Greg Court, USA Today, Executive Orders Memoranda, he very nicely kind of breaks it down about what they can all do and how much weight they all carry and what kind of effect they can have. Well, I, I think that that would be great and very helpful because, you know, like we say, we always talk about the alphabet soup, but even within the alphabet soup, there's sort of sub issues that come up about where everything falls and, and what weight and power they carry. Yeah. And how policies get made. You mm -hmm. know, the last administration policies get made with a tweet. So, you know, 
it, it is, you know, some things have lots of process and others don't. Um, we have a question from Steve and, uh, you know, this is, I, I think it's related again to some of the stuff we talked on is that when we look at these new Biden executive orders, which poses the most danger to civil liberties? I think, you know, I'll, I'll take a little bit of lead on this because this is obviously mm -hmm. what NCLA regularly works on, but I do think that, as we mentioned, the revocation of 13891 and 13892 regarding guidance documents and how they're used in enforcement proceedings, particularly, um, poses the most threat because it, it takes away certainty about what obligations you have under the law. Um, and so that that's from my viewpoint, I think one of the more dangerous ones, but I don't know if you have some thoughts about how some of these executive orders may encroach on civil liberties. And I think, um, I don't think I can add to what you said. I think that's an important insight. And I haven't read all the executive orders, so I don't really know, but of the ones that I've looked at, um, I'm not sure that I would have been as articulate about it as you just were, but I think that's right. Well, thank you for that. Um, and we have one final question, and I think it might be top of mind of some folks because of the past 24 or 48 hours um, in the securities industry. You know, is there any sort of appetite that you've heard from the regulatory sense of, of looking at fixes to Dodd-Frank um, or that may be in the pipeline and, and how do those go through? Because obviously Dodd-Frank is an interesting statute in that it goes through both a cabinet level agency as well as CFPB, um, which is an independent regulatory agency has some um, requirements in there. I mean, how, how does that work, especially when you're dealing with agencies that have overlap and one of them is an independent agency? Yeah, we didn't talk about independent agencies at all. Um, so independent agencies like um, the Securities and Exchange Commission or CFTC or Consumer Finance, uh, um, Consumer Product Safety Commission, they do not go through all that OIRA process that I talked about. They are exempt from that. Um, the CFPB is kind of a um, an odd duck because, because they're not a multi-headed agency. Um, the courts have said they, they really aren't as independent. And so the president could easily bring them into, into the fold. Also, and I'm kind of going off topic, but I'm doing what you're supposed to do with reporters is pivot to something that I actually know about. So I'll do that. The um, Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, a couple of weeks before the end of the Trump administration released a, um, an opinion that they had actually written a year earlier that said, presidents can require independent agencies to comply with the procedures and analytical requirements of that these two executive orders that we've talked about and that um, President Biden has retained. So it'll, I'll be very interested to see whether President Biden does do that. So Sally Katzen, who was the head of the head of OIRA, so the same job I had in the Clinton administration, and actually the author of that Clinton order that has lasted so long. Um, she and I will, um, when we find things we agree on, we'll write op-eds in the Wall Street Journal. And we had one recently encouraging the new administration to take advantage of that Office of Legal Counsel opinion and cover independent agencies. And I, I think to your point, I mean, it sounds like that would, again, going back to your sort of transparency and fairness considerations and regulation, it seems there's no harm to take these extra looks at what the potential impact of a regulation may be, particularly, as you said, in, in financial regulation, where it has such a huge impact on the market. Yeah, and people who have studied it find that the, the independent regulatory agencies, even when they have a very um, similar portfolio, their, the analysis that they conduct before issuing regulations is much less sophisticated than the executive branch agencies. And that probably is largely because there's a check um, on the executive branch analyses where there isn't on the independents. And we are just at the very end of our time. Susan, I wanted to thank you for, for spending the afternoon with us and talking about these interesting topics. I know I learned a lot um, and I look forward to seeing the work you do in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.